Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation, Data-Driven Collection Development, the Approval Plan in Today's Academic Library, which is sponsored by Gobi Library Solutions from EBSCO. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you'll probably see a Q&A panel and uh, a chat panel. If you don't see the chat panel, you can click the button with the dialog cloud um, at the bottom of your screen to activate that panel. Please use the Q&A panel to submit questions um, to our speakers. At the end of the presentation, they'll take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please do send them in throughout. And if you're experiencing any technical issues, please use the chat panel to let me know, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we are using the hashtag ACRLChoiceWebinars. Um, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. And you can also find Gobi on Twitter at Gobi underscore EBSCO. And uh, at this point, it, we are, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Fast, the Director of Collection Development and Workflow Solutions for Gobi, um, who will be our session's moderator today. So with that, we are ready to get started, and I'll pass it over to you, Ashley. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone, that has taken time out of your busy schedule today to join us for this webinar on data-driven collection development, the approval plan in today's academic library. I am joined by two panelists today. So I have Christine Fisher, who's the Head of Technical Services at UNC Greensboro, where she has worked since 2005. She earned her BA degree at East Tennessee State University and her MSLS from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In addition, I'm joined by Simona Tabakuru. She's a Collection Development Librarian at the Texas A&M University Library. She worked for the library since 2006, and in 2013, she joined the library faculty. Simona has been involved with the implementation of the current electronic preferred approval plan and the DDA, Demand Driven Acquisitions Program at the Texas A&M University Libraries. And as Mark mentioned a section ago, I am Ashley Fast. I'm the Director of Collection Development and Workflow Solutions. Gobi Library Solutions from EBSCO. I've been in this role or with the company since 2008, and prior to that, I worked for in technical services at the University of Southern Mississippi. So before we hop into things today, a quick agenda so you know kind of where things are going and what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to start with an overview of each of these libraries, as well as a general collection development approach. After that, we'll segue into a Q&A with the panelists followed by key takeaways, and as Mark mentioned, we will do questions at the end. So please don't hesitate to type those in. He's going to be gathering them, and then we'll have a chance to talk to the panelists once we get through the bulk of this. So I'm going to turn it over to Christine to start with UNC Greensboro Libraries. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, I'm Christine Fisher. Uh, UNC Greensboro is one of 17 institutions in the University of North Carolina system, and our fall 2018 campus enrollment was just over 20,000 students. The university libraries are the main library, Jackson Library, and the Harold Shipman Music Library. We have 95 faculty and staff. Our collections include 1 million print titles, 1.2 million ebook titles, and about 287,000 electronic media titles. The collections budget this year is $3.7 million. And we are a member of ACERL, the Association of Southeastern Research Libraries. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the Texas A&M University Libraries. Thank you, Ashley. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to give you some background information about the Texas A&M University, which was founded in 1876 as the state first public institution of higher education. 
We are currently serving over 64,000 students on the main campus in College Station and another 5,200 students at our branch campuses in Galveston, Qatar, and Health Science Center locations across Texas. We also serve 3,750 faculty on our campus. We are a research intensive institution best known for our STEM programs, engineering, agriculture, veterinary medicine, but we also serve business management, marketing, interdisciplinary studies, and social sciences programs. We have five libraries on our campus. Um, the Evans uh, Library in the Annex is the main library for general collections. Uh, the Cushing Memorial Library is the rare books, special collections, manuscripts, and the university archives. The Medical Sciences Library, which supports the medical and veterinary science programs. We also have a smaller library, the Policy Sciences and Economics Library, which supports the George Bush School and the Political Sciences and Economics Department. And lastly, the West Campus Library, which is our business library. Texas A&M University Library is a member of the American Research Library and also a member of the Greater Western Library Alliance, GOLA, a consortium of 39 research libraries across the United States. We are also a member of the Center for Research Libraries, and we are participating in TechShare, which is a consortium of Texas libraries joining together to share print and electronic materials. Our collection development activities are guided by an overarching collection development policy and a 73 subject-specific collection development policy statement that are managed by 35 subject librarians. Currently, our collections include more than 5.6 million print volumes and 1.7 million ebooks. We also have more than 206,000 print and online journals and 1,712 databases. We are very fortunate to have a healthy materials budget of 16.3 million. And in the last fiscal year, our collection expenditures included over 14 million for continuing resources, serial and database subscriptions, and over 2.3 million for one-time purchases, which includes print and ebooks, streaming videos, music scores, data sets, and other one-time purchases. In the last fiscal year, we spent $1.3 million on approval plan books and over $300,000 on uh, demand-driven acquisition titles. And I'll turn it back to you, Ashley. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the approval plan at each of these libraries. Christine? Yes. Uh, the UNCG Libraries initiated our University Press approval plan in 1989 with our primary book vendor, YBP, now called Gobi. In the early 1990s, we added trade publishers to the plan. The plan evolved over the years until in 2014, we activated our demand-driven acquisitions plan, starting with EBL titles. At the start of our DDA plan, we had the first use of a title trigger a short-term loan the second use triggered the purchase. We reviewed our plan activity and concluded that we would eliminate the short-term loan step in the process and simply trigger a purchase on the first use. That change was implemented in January of 2017. We've had continuous use of GOBI notifications for faculty, initially with print slips years ago, and then moving to fully electronic notifications, which are actively used by our faculty. Just to give a sense of our expenditures, during fiscal year 2017-18, we spent $32,500 on approvals and $37,000 on DDA purchases. And uh, at Texas A&M University, we started um, first approval plan with Baker and Taylor in January 1971. The plan included all publications from university presses. In January 1976, we migrated the approval plan to Blackwell, North America. In 2006, we uh, migrated from Blackwell to Gobi Library Solutions and adopted a subject profile based on the Library of Congress classification system. Uh, Gobi Library Solutions has been not only our primary approval plan vendor, but also our primary book vendor for firm orders. In fall 2010, we migrated to an electronic preferred approval plan. Uh, 
Uh, this decision was made in response to a strategic library directive to acquire electronic content when appropriate to the subject area and, of course, whenever possible in order to enhance user access to scholarly content. Of the 73 subject areas covered by the existing subject collection development policy statement, 56 subject areas are set up to an electronic preferred format on the approval plan. 10 subject areas are set up as print preferred, and mainly these are the humanities disciplines. And seven subject areas have a mix of print and ebooks. And in 2012, we implemented a demand driven acquisition program with Gobi Library Solutions and selected Ibrary as our ebook aggregator. Currently, we have DDA programs for ebooks with uh, both ProQuest and EBSCO. And I'll turn it back to you, Ashley. Thank you. So before we get into the questions of things, just some kind of laying the groundwork as we talk about approval profiles for everybody in the call, just kind of what they are and what we're what we mean when we talk about these. So, approval profiles allow a library to acquire ebooks or print books, monographs, whether they're automatic shipments to the library or some notification slip to a selector or, as Christine mentioned, to a faculty member to help determine what is appropriate for the library's collection. Approval plans include non subject parameters, a publisher list, and then in the case of Gobi, we have profilers that add extra metadata to the to the notifications that selectors see to help with their decision. And in this metadata, things like interdisciplinary topics are included, aspects, and any other extra bits of information a human can put in to help a selector make an informed decision. In addition to approval profiles, you can add things like award programs, um, reviews, and get that content into your library. There are different outcomes for approval plans, whether it's print or electronic, um, an automatic book shipment, a notification slip, and then profiles also help drive things like a demand-driven acquisitions program. There are three main types of approval profiles, which you've heard both of these ladies mention. We've got e-preferred, whereas if the e-book's available over the print, the library receives access to that e-book or either gets a notification slip for that e-preferred title. There's print approval plans, and then there's e-only approval plans. Approval plans have a lot of different functions in the today's library environment. There's a very traditional way an approval plan works, whereas it sends a book shipment to a library or a notification slip to a selector where they in turn review those slips and make firm orders from them. Approval plans also underpin programs such as demand-driven acquisitions. You heard both of these libraries talk about running a DDA program and their approval plan is what helps drive and vet the content that they put in their pool for their patrons to select from. Approval plans are flexible and customizable and can fit the needs of many different size libraries, ranging from a small community college to a comprehensive four-year to a large ARL university. So as we kind of have heard from both of these schools about some general information about the library and how they're using approval plans, we're going to get into some detailed questions. So to start, what are the top benefits that your approval plan has brought to your library. We'll start with UNC Greensboro. As we all know, title by title selection of resources for our collections is not sustainable. The approval plan offers the opportunity to develop a profile that suits the school's curriculum and research needs. The library knows it will automatically receive the books and ebooks that match the profile. The approval plan benefits faculty because they can rely on the plan to supply the books or to supply notifications that they can make recommendations from to ensure that the library acquires the needed resources. Library liaisons and subject librarians are more and more focusing their work on instruction, consultations, direct work with faculty, and outreach. They are spending less time on collection development, so the approval plan saves them time. We appreciate that our DDA plan is supplemented by other aspects of the approval plan, so books and ebooks are purchased or made available through notifications when a title isn't available as DDA. Simona? Thank you. So for Texas A&M University, we use the approval plan to purchase all new publications that match our library's collecting profile. And among the benefits, I would mention time and cost savings. Uh, subject librarians can fo focus on their efforts of assessing the collection rather than spending their time with title-by-title -title selections. 
Uh, they can focus on identifying and ordering titles from smaller presses not covered by the approval plan. And of course, like uh, Christine mentioned, they can dedicate more time to other responsibilities such as outreach and liaison activities. The approval books arrive shelf ready, so our acquisition staff spend less time processing these monographic purchases, and the library receives a price discount from the approval vendor. With an approval plan, we streamlined workflows. Uh, since we have any preferred approval plan, acquisition of ebooks is streamlined in the pre existing workflows for uh, print books. Our approval plan ensures flexibility in monographic acquisitions. We can better monitor and control duplication between print and electronic formats. And we can easily assess our monographic purchases through different acquisition methods like approval plan, firm orders, and uh, DDA uh, ebook purchases. Because we use Gobi Library Solutions as our primary book vendor, and all purchase activity, publisher, and cost data is available from the Gobi database. Back to you. Thank Ashley. you. So, how does your approval plan support the acquisitions of digital resources, including things like DDA? Simona? Right. So as I mentioned before, we implemented any preferred approval plan in fall 2010. For our library, an approval plan means that the library would prefer a book instead of a print book, with the condition that the book is released within uh, the ebook is released within six to eight weeks following its print counterpart. If an ebook is not released after eight weeks, we will receive the print book instead. So we still benefit from the broad coverage needed to support our faculty and students. Uh, during uh, fiscal year 2011 to 2018, we have purchased from Gobi over 26,000 ebooks on approval plan and over 7,000 ebooks through firm orders. So we are still purchasing most of the approval plan books in print because of the profile being set up to print for most of the humanities disciplines and we purchase books heavily in this subject area. Uh, the approval plan supports ebook purchases on publisher direct platforms. The plan is flexible and gives libraries the option to select a priority order for their uh, ebook suppliers. We have changed the ebook suppliers grid in 2017, and we now prefer publisher direct platforms over aggregator platforms. So of the 5,652 ebooks purchased in fiscal year 2018, more than 37% are on publisher direct platforms. And of course, to supplement our ebook offerings, in uh, 2012 we implemented uh, a DDA program for ebooks. So our DDA pool consists of titles marked as notification slips on the approval plan. And you can see in uh, fiscal years 2012 to 2018, we purchased uh, 11,586 ebooks on DDA. Our pool of DDA records in our knowledge base is 7,800 titles. From fiscal year 2013 2014, when we started our demand driven acquisitions plan through April 2019, we have purchased 890 ebooks via DDA, which is much smaller than our uh, friends with, with Simona's Texas A&M, but um, we still find this a really valuable resource for us. ProQuest eBook Central is our preferred aggregator, and we have a priority set, so we will get nonlinear lending usage if it's available. If not, then three years users or finally one user. If eBook Central doesn't offer a title by DDA, Gobi will then check to see if an EBSCO eBook with one user option is available. If no DDA title option is available, we go to the approval plan for either print copies or notifications. In the past 12 months, we purchased 1,100 approval titles, 345 DDA titles, and 2,500 firm orders through Gobi Library Solutions. And we also purchased titles on publisher direct platforms. Thank you guys so much. Super interesting to see how a profile can work for two libraries in different sizes when you're using very similar models on whole. I'll throw that in there. 
So moving on, what specific aspects or data points of your approval plan have been the most helpful? We'll start with you, Christine. All right. As for the approval profile itself, we've structured ours with the uppermost parameters being based on LC classes and our preferred publishers. From there, we set a price ceiling for the titles that varies depending on LC class and whether the title is print or electronic. As I mentioned earlier, we have strong use of notifications by faculty and our library liaisons are active in working with new faculty to participate. The approval plan and DDA plan are integrated well. We also like that GOBI can accommodate additional needs. And Ashley mentioned this uh, earlier. For, for instance, we know we'll receive the National Book Award winners and several other award-winning books in case we hadn't already added them to our collection before they were honored and recognized. Simona? Sure. Um, so in our case, understanding the hierarchy that influences the approval profile, such as series, publishers, non-subject parameters, and a Library of Congress classification is very important. Uh, in our case, learning the priority order and how these dimensions influence the approval plan helped us tweak the subject profiles in order to receive the books we actually want. Also, understanding how exceptions can override the instruction for the approval profile is important. Decisions made at publisher level have been most effective for us. Being able to slip or exclude some publishers from the profile made an impact on cost savings. Uh, also, our subject librarians receive notification slips by email and are able to firm order only the books they want instead of receiving them automatically on the approval plan for selected subject areas. Uh, we also have the ability to choose the primary book suppliers and uh, type of access, uh, like uh, Christine mentioned, um, simultaneous user access, three user access, or single user access. And this aspect is, again, important for our library. And I will also add that we can control expenses made on the approval plan because we can run reports and determine the output of publishers ahead of time and estimate how much we would spend with a particular publisher. Uh, and this enables us to implement changes uh, as needed. Back to you, Ashley. Thank you. And we have one more question for you guys. So how do you see the future of the approval plan at your library work? Start with okay, you, I will start. This is Simona again. So I believe that the approval plan will remain an effective tool in building our core collections. Uh, as subject librarians are tasked with outreach and liaison activities, they have less time to devote to collection development, particularly to title by title selection. So the approval plan will continue to support their collection development activities. Again, assessment and tweaking of the approval profile will continue in response to our faculties and students' research needs and in support of new programs. And I believe that the approval plan will continue to provide support for new access and acquisition models. So it is likely that the effectiveness of the approval plan will be harnessed to support this new access and acquisition models. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. I'll send it to you, uh, Christine. Thank you. As Simona does at Texas A&M, we at UNC Greensboro are routinely adjusting our approval plan to meet current needs and to address changes such as when a new program or new department is created. We just want to be sure that faculty have the titles they need as much as that is possible. We use GOBI reports on expenditures and approval activity to help inform our decisions on revisions to the approval plan also. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm going to switch to our last slide, but I have a really great question that just came in. I think we should answer. I'm going to put both you guys on the spot before we get into general questions from the group and these key takeaways. So we just got a great question that says, have either libraries assessed use of firm order in approval plan titles? And if so, what did you find? Would either of you like to answer that one while we have the time? Uh, I can take this question, yes. I uh, did uh, look into books purchased on approval plan and books purchased as firm order. Uh, I looked at uh, purchases by uh, subject areas and um, like I 
uh, firm orders are still used uh, more heavily than uh, books uh, on approval plans. So the the difference is not um, too significant, though. So let's say 40% uh, of the approval plan books are being used, and 50% of the firm orders uh, are uh, again are being used, and the percentages are similar between print format and electronic format. So um, there are a few subject areas where actually the approval plan books are being used uh, more heavily than uh, the firm orders. So we are working with the subject librarians to explain that maybe they don't need to firm order so many books since they don't get as much use as the books on the approval plan. But um, yeah, the Overall, the firm orders are, are used a little bit more than, than uh, the approval plan books. So I hope this answers your question. And at UNC Greensboro, we found uh, the same thing as far as it tends to have, there tends to be more use of firm order titles than approvals uh, overall. But that's the beauty of the DDA plan because you know that the book's been used and that takes it out of it's it's not automatically sent as a, a, a print or ebook it's only triggered when it's used so we we consider that a um, really valuable uh, way for us to add to the collection and know that the material is used thank you guys before we get into i see some questions coming in which is fantastic and mark will kind of take it over in a second and mediate those and send them out to the group so we can all answer them but before we get to that just kind of a wrap up of what we've talked about today, that approval plans don't just support electronic and ebook automatic shipments or notification slips, but they allow a library to do things such as underpin a DDA pool, which both of these libraries have talked about doing. So you get the content in all different ways to your patrons, whether it is through automatic shipments, notification slips that are then firm ordered, or titles discoverable in your catalog via DDA. Approval plans are dynamic and evolve as new technologies are introduced. We've seen this over the last decade. It's, it's been fascinating to come into this field um, in the, I guess it's late 2000 aughts, whatever you call it, 2008, um, when I finished library school and I started this role, it was print only in an approval plan and it's evolved so much in the last 11 years. Now we've got DDA, we've got e-collections that are a part of a mix and libraries being able to invoice those to deduplicate from a plan. Most recently, we've got evidence-based acquisitions models coming out and I can only suspect that this is going to continue to evolve. And things like approval plans are more important than ever today in today's complex acquisition environment. As librarians and selectors are doing more with their time, whether it's liaison duties, faculty outreach, instruction, um, we don't get more hours in the day. And so having tools in place to help librarians make informed decisions for their lack of time that they have um, only help and benefit the field as a whole. Um, so as we kind of have gone through the questions we've had set, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to ask questions that have come in from folks. All right, thank you. Um, as, as has been mentioned, we do have several questions in the queue already, um, but we have time and I would say if, if you have questions for us, drop them into the Q&A box and um, we'll get to as many as we have time for. All right, so to take a look there, we've got questions coming in from all over the place. Um, Let's see, to go back to the earliest ones. Um, we've got one that came in earlier in the presentation from Barb. Um, and Barb says, how did you assess that title by title is not sustainable? Um, and she goes on to, to mention that these libraries have large budgets. Um, what about the, those of us who can't afford $45,000 a year on an approval uh, plan purchase system? Uh, do you acquire all of your monographs through uh, just one vendor, or do you work with other uh, multiple folks? So multiple questions there. Maybe we can um, start with that first one and say, how did how did each of you assess that title by title was was not sustainable? Well, title by title just takes up so much time, and it and it requires 
the liaison or a faculty member on campus to um, look at a catalog or read a newspaper article or read an art, uh, well, look at a, a, a list of citations at the end of an article and make, make some choices. We were noticing that fewer and fewer uh, requests were coming in and we knew that uh, we needed to have material on hand for, for students and for research. And it's not that they didn't want the materials, it's just that the faculty didn't have time to make individual title selections. So the approval plan uh, was able, you know, we started off with the university press approval plan. We knew that we wanted output by particular publishers. And so we set up the, the profile with the, based on subject area and then with those publishers and, and it grew from there. So uh, for Texas i and &M, I hope you noticed how large our materials budget is. And um, basically we spend a million, even more than that, a year on uh, monographic purchases. So uh, expecting the subject librarians to purchase all these books uh, with title by title selection is not feasible. Uh, our selectors are really, really uh, involved with uh, different uh, activities. Um, they do instruction, they do reference, they do um, um, scholarly communication activities. So they have less and less time to spend with title by title selection. That's not to say we are not doing, you, you saw that we do have uh, print orders and uh, firm orders and um, we also have a separate budget. Uh, it, it is called uh, user generated um, fund. So every uh, purchase request coming from uh, faculty or students on campus uh, it goes through a service, we call it Suggest a Purchase, and um, we all, um, I don't recall right now, maybe it's 100,000, we put over that uh, funding, that fund, and we purchase everything, uh, any request that's below $150, so we accommodate that type of uh, patron-driven acquisition. It's another type of patron-driven acquisition. We also have the demand-driven acquisition that, that's another patron-initiated request. So, um, I think we try to offer all purchasing methods and models available so we enrich our collections. And the approval plan, it's really, um, uh, we keep the approval plan to make sure that our co we keep core collections, we develop, we build core collections for our libraries and we are not missing on important titles, but um, um, so that's, uh, that's the way we envision our collection development uh, activities for monographic purchases. Great, and great. Actually, and oh, and I was going to say, Ashley, I think the, the second part of that question really is perhaps a question for you. Um, if, so what about smaller libraries without yeah. such large budgets? How, how does an approval plan fit in there? Yeah, so somebody who kind of works with a gamut of different size libraries over the years, whether I've seen libraries with a $10,000 budget have an approval plan up to a, a large ARL, such as Simona School that she works at, and an approval plan really can be tailored to the needs of the library that we're working with. And so for a small university library or a college library, the real big value of an approval plan, you may not necessarily get book shipments from that plan with a small library budget. You may want to do that title by title selection because of the, the smaller amount you get to spend every year. But the thing an approval plan can do is it can bring you notification slips on a weekly basis of new content where you're not going through those catalogs like Christine mentioned or waiting on a faculty member to give you a request. You can actually proactively keep up with publishing output within these guidelines that you set your library needs to see. So rather than, rather than sifting through 500 new titles a week, you can target down, I need the 50 core things in these subject ranges and that's what I'm going to look at, whether it's a weekly basis or a monthly basis, and it, it's time saving is, is what it is. So you're able to target into the material you need to see and then make 
really, you know you're going to make good selections from what's coming out in those notification slips. Excellent. Great. So um, we're going to move on to a question I think that came in from Mabel here. And Mabel asks, are your libraries mem members of a consortium catalog? And if so, do your ebook records work for only your patrons or do they go out to the consortium? Um, and uh, so are, are either of your libraries members? UNC Greensboro is not. Okay. We are our own uh, collection here. Neither is Texas A&M. We, we manage our budget and we, um, yeah, we okay. don't collaborate. Then that's pretty straightforward then, absolutely. Um, and do the ebook records work uh, just as well off campus for your patrons? Have you noticed any difference there? Uh, this is Simona. Um, it's hard to uh, analyze the ebooks that way because we um, don't track uh, remote uh, access for uh, for students. We uh, uh, we looked at ebook usage, but we cannot tell if it's used on campus or out of uh, campus. So remote access, we don't track that information. Sure, sure. Well, just based on uh, for us, based on any kind of issues that, that a student would run into and where they might chat with someone at the reference desk. We have people accessing these ebooks from on campus and off. And you know, if there's if there's an, a problem, it might just be uh, a, pr a problem with the, the platform that can be resolved easily. Uh, so if we're getting plenty of use both both on and off campus and we don't have any uh, particular issues unless some small thing comes up from time to time. Sure, sure. Great. Um, and this, I'm not sure whether uh, each of you is, is comfortable uh, with this, but, but I think there is a fair amount of interest in it. Um, folks are, are curious about what the price ceiling is that you set on um, book purchases. Are you, uh, is, would you be willing to share that? I guess I'll start. Uh, we have, uh, we, we vary ba based on the discipline. So for instance, our overall just regular print uh, approval plan is $100 for a book. Now, that will cover certain disciplines pretty well, but we found that we were getting so many things in philosophy and religion, for example, that we dropped that down to $85. Hmm. But with yeah. chemistry and that, we've, we've got um, a couple of hundred. And then with eBooks, it's like 300 to 350 as our um, um, upper limit because when you're looking at nonlinear lending, uh, that kind of thing, you're going to have uh, a higher price for a book than a one user. So we base it on the subject area and whether or not it's print or e. Very interesting. And Simona is sure. Um, set up. Yes, uh, we uh, again it depends on disciplines and if it's a um, large series or we made some uh, adjustments based on series or based on uh, different format types. Um, so, but, but the general price ceiling is 250 now and we dropped it actually to 150 um, for a book. Hmm. Okay. I don't think we distinguish between print and electronic format. I don't recall that. Okay, great. Um, and we've got a, a question here from, from Adam who asks, what methods do you use to assess, to assess the success of your approval plans? So I will start. Um, we are um, looking at usage, of course, and um, the number of titles that we purchase every year and um, how this titles are distributed by uh, disciplines and by programs on campus, and we make sure that um, all of our uh, programs are being supported by the acquisition of uh, print and electronic. Um, we also, like I said, uh, not all our subject areas are uh, set up as electronic preferred because in the humanities we've heard from our faculty that they would still like uh, the print format. So most of the humanities are set up as print. Um, we don't see as much use of our 
print books. Uh, we are a little bit concerned about the large numbers coming in the humanities, and um, we don't see actually the, the youth that we would like to see. So um, it's hard to benchmark uh, to say what uh, percentage of your books, it's a good usage, it's a good number. Uh, from studies, you see anywhere between 31% to 45%. And this is scary because these are not um, high numbers. But um, I um, looked out at our usage over time, like a trend analysis. And um, even in the seventh uh, year, the books uh, and the books purchased uh, are still circulating. So there is a Cornell study that says that 45% of the print book collections only circulated in their case. Uh, so having these numbers in mind, uh, we see uh, between 49 and 50% usage over five to seven years in the collection. So we, we take this as a benchmark and um, if we get 50% use of our large collections, then um, um, it's okay, but we, we really want to increase the num these numbers. So uh, having the approval profile, we um, now address the areas of non-use and try to uh, adjust the profile where, where we see that the books are not um, are not getting the use we uh, we would like to see, but this is again uh, it depends on discipline. We know that some subject areas maybe prefer other type of materials and not books. Maybe they want to use databases and uh, journals and not as much monographs. So it's um, it's very complex. So analyzing um, the approval plan is a complex process and it takes time, but we address one subject at a time and I think we are successful in that uh, regard. But overall, you know, the trends at um, uh, nationwide and I would say worldwide, uh, the, sometimes the use of books is decreasing. So we try to <laughs> push those materials to, to our students and faculty. So that's my response to that. Excellent. And and um, Christine, would you like to respond to judging the success of the approval plan as well? well I would say just like Simona, um, not quite as in depth. We aren't aren't getting in, involved as, as as thoroughly as Texas A and M in the in the research and evaluation. But we do look at use and we do a circulation and and all. And we do look to be sure that we're covering. Uh, a variety of disciplines um, and, and adequately supporting the different uh, academic departments on campus. Great, great. Um, and we've got a question here from Susan who asks, has the DDA or EBA model increased your materials budgets during the past three years? And has have either of you seen that at, at your libraries that you're in response to these different things that your materials budgets have had to be adjust, adjusted and those sorts of things? Well, we have made, uh, yes, we at UNC Greensboro, we have several DDA or PDA plans and we have evidence-based plans with specific publishers. So we, we have decreased compared to, you know, let's say six years ago, uh, we, we are spending less on on books, but we're still um, spending a good bit. But the thing with the EBA plan, as you say in advance, we will spend X amount this year. You get the usage over the year, then you make the de decision on which books to select for the permanent collection. And because you're specifying a certain dollar amount, you know what it is for that year that you're going to be spending. So, you know, the DDA plan is harder to uh, estimate um, and you do get you know over over a matter of years you have older titles in the collection you know public publication years earlier uh, but we have a lot of people who you know we'll we'll see a hit we'll pur purchase a title and it's from 2012 but 
you know, it's the same as if it was in the stacks as a print book. You don't know when people are going to need something. So um, the DDA plan is not as uh, easy to estimate, but we aren't spending as much on the approval plan because we have the DDA plan. Interesting, interesting. Um, so and Texas, Simona, yeah. please go ahead. <laughs> for Texas A&M, uh, we really have two parts of money. One is for one-time purchases, which uh, includes monographic acquisitions and everything else. That's one time. And then the other uh, fund is for um, uh, continuing resources, which is serials and databases, so recurring uh, costs. Uh, so uh, within the one-time purchases, we uh, reallocate money for different uh, purchasing methods. So if we see that our DDA, demand-driven acquisition uh, budget, goes uh, uh, over the money that we allocated at the beginning of the fiscal year, then we supplement with money from the approval plan. Where, so we have to move funds within the one-time funding that we have allocated at the beginning of the year. So to answer your question, yes, uh, the DDA is going up, but we, uh, we have to reallocate money with, within the, those uh, one-time uh, money that we have uh, available. And um, with EBA, it's the same as Christine mentioned. So um, we do have two EBA programs. We start with a fixed uh, sum, fixed amount, and basically we work with the, the money we have. So um, it's uh, pre-budgeted, so to speak. So we, don't, we will not add additional money to, <laughs> to the monographic purchases. Sure, sure. We move it's, money around, yes. Yep, once it's set, it's set, and yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, so we've got a, a question here um, from Margie who asks, after the initial or second use of an e-book, how do usage statistics for DDA titles compare to usage stats for non-DDA titles? Are you, have you looked that sort of closely at, at the DDA titles in the collection? Early on, we did look at that. I haven't looked at it in the past two years. Uh, and we did see that if something was used, uh, it was more likely to be used a second time. There, hmm. there often was uh, continued, uh, uh, there were often additional uses to a title after the, the, the initial use. Great. Yes, I uh, I agree with Christine. I haven't done a, like a recent assessment of the DDA titles to that level. Uh, that's on my list, on my to-do list. I want to see, uh, you know, with a second or a third um, use of the DDA, what is the percentage of the DDA titles actually being used. But I we do see uh, high percentages though in uh, in the DDA uh, titles high percentages of use and uh, I did uh, cost per use analysis and the DDA titles um, are the most uh, effective in our case mm -hmm. so they get the lowest uh, cost per use uh, as an ebook. Wow, very interesting. Yeah, um, we've got. Um, a question here, which I think is perhaps for Ashley from Pat. Um, and Pat asks, we have Gobi slash YBP, but I mostly use it for firm orders of print titles, but they're only a communi community college with no subject liaisons. Um, could Pat set up an approval plan just for eBooks if required? How would something like that work? Yeah, happy to answer it. You can totally do that. So I mentioned when I was talking through the slides that you can do e-preferred, e-only, or print plans. So if you, were, if you are firm ordering print books and you're interested in adding e-book order workflow in there, because I think Simona said it a little while ago, the order workflow for P&E through Gobi is very, very similar, if not almost the same. So as far as time savings goes, by ordering both through one place, you're still getting access on the platform you purchase it on but your order workflow on the back end is saving you a bit of time and then you can do all the electronic invoicing or get records for it if you want to do that. 
And so if you're just interested in ebooks, you could set up one of those ebook only plans in the subject area you're interested in. Pick the suppliers. I think um, I can't remember who mentioned it, but we have basically a cascade of suppliers. So if there's three, an aggregator and a few publisher direct people that you order from, you can say, I just want to see ebooks from those so I don't have to look through the things that I'm not able to buy from. And here's the subject areas I want, and I want community college level titles. I don't need professional level. And so you can set up a, an approval profile and just for notification slips and just for ebooks if you want for the areas that you're interested in getting that new e-content from. So it's a relatively, I call it painless process. You would work with your rep and set that up and then get those on a weekly, biweekly, or monthly basis sent to your inbox. And my email is down there if you are, as I'm, because I know I, you guys can hear me and I can't hear you. But if you have any more questions or want to chat about it, feel free to shoot me an email. Excellent. Great. Um, we've got several more questions in, in the queue. I'm not sure that we'll actually have time to get to all of the questions today. So in advance, I apologize for that. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, we've got a question from UF Smathers Libraries that asks, um, and, and maybe uh, Simona, we could start with you on this. Do your selectors review books sent on approval before they accept them? Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, for the approval plan for the ebooks, actually, there is a possibility to review a book. Actually, you can, uh, there is a bookshelf, like um, Gobi releases the ebooks every Saturday, I believe. And uh, you as a selector can get into the bookshelf and uh, filter those books by your subject area. And you can see the books coming on approval in your subject area. So you can review those books. Actually, you have the opportunity to um, open, to preview the book. And uh, it's still not purchased yet, and you have the opportunity to accept it or reject it. So once it's rejected, you basically remove the book from the um, from the bookshelf, from the approval plan, so you are not uh, getting the book anymore. Uh, I don't really have a um, numbers to tell you how selectors are using this uh, option, but it's there. It's a, it's a possibility. Yes. For print books, it's harder because basically the print books come uh, it's, uh, automatically shipped on the approval plan, so you cannot really review those books. They, uh, but they are tailored. They are uh, the approval plan is really carefully calibrated, so we really get the books that we want on the, in the print. And if not, we can adjust the approval plan. It's, we are doing this every year, and more than one time a year, we, we readjust the approval plan. We look at subject areas, we look at um, publishers that maybe don't get as much use as we would like, and then we can slip. Instead of having a book sent automatically on the approval plan, we decide to slip that publisher. So slipping means that instead of getting the book, you receive the uh, notification slip. You open that notification slip, review it, and then you you have to firm order that book because you will not receive it automatically on the approval plan. So uh, yes, we use it different ways, but um, we don't have the book in hand for print, but uh, for ebooks, it's uh, really valuable the option to review the book. I think I answered your question. Yeah, I believe I believe so. Very very interesting. And um, Christine, is the process similar at UNCG? We do not use the the approval bookshelf. Anything okay. that comes on the approval plan, we just accept. And uh, as far as print titles go, the only thing that we would uh, return is if it, if the book was damaged in some way. And that always that process works fine. But uh, uh, Simona did mention something that we really like, and that is there is a preview option when you're looking in the platform, the Gobi platform, and you, you're looking at a title. If it's available as an ebook, you can have five minutes to, to view, uh, to, you know, to look around in the title and kind of get a sense of it. So that is helpful 
if you're making a specific decision on an individual title, uh, I really love that feature. Excellent. Um, we've got a question here from Paul, and Paul asks, um, and I'm going to I'm going to mess up these uh, abbreviations, so please correct me if if you know it there. When using a combination of FO, I assume is firm order approval plan and DDA for acquisitions, demand driven acquisition. I think I got them all. Uh, what measures or procedures do you use to avoid duplication? I'll, I'll take this question. Okay. So, uh, because uh, we purchase our firm orders, like I mentioned, mainly through the approval plan, and then uh, the approval plan, of, of course, through Gobi, I want to say, and the DDA titles also through Gobi, uh, they uh, dedupe uh, the books uh, for us um, based on the ISBN numbers. So, this will catch most of the duplication. Um, if we purchase books outside Gobi, we send um, to Gobi, um, uh, I don't know if it's weekly, or, but we send our holdings to Gobi so they can dig up against our um, monographic purchases. So that's the way we control duplication at our institution. Right, and for us, it's the same the same concept that if you're using them as the primary book vendor, whether it's approval or firm, that means that that Gobi knows what you've what you've purchased, and they won't send it out again. For those uh, EBA plans we have with particular publishers, we remove those publishers from the approval plan. Uh, we don't we don't get anything automatically from them, so we can, we avoid uh, that uh, possibility of duplication as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, we've got a question from Anna. We have time maybe for one or two more. Um, from And Anna asks, what is the delay between ebook and print version if you have an e-preferred plan? In other words, if the ebook comes out last, do you find that you get the print in advance or do you wait for the ebook version? How does that work at, at your libraries? Yes, that's a great question. So this is Simona. Uh, we uh, wait eight weeks. So on the approval plan, we specify that if a book, uh, an ebook, is not released within eight weeks after the print is published, then we will accept the print book. So um, we miss an opportunity there because if we really want ebooks, if they are not released within that eight-week window, we will not get it. That's why I, I mentioned in my slides that uh, we still purchase primarily print books, like 78% uh, are uh, print books, uh, but not necessarily in the areas where uh, appro the approval plan is set up uh, as electronic preferred. In those subject areas, we purchase 50% e-books and 50% print books. And this is, again, some publishers might not have ever publish an ebook and others might protect that ebook and don't release it within these eight weeks. So uh, we we have to work with the publishers a lot and tell them that we really want them to release their ebooks simultaneously as the simultaneously as the print book so we can have a real opportunity to purchase the format that we really want. And then so with that, that, is that oh, excuse me. Go for it. I'll I'll wrap up after you're done. How's that sound? Okay. I was just going to say that that uh, we've noticed over the past couple of years that they're they're the the print and the e are coming out closer together or or simultaneously. It's not mm -hmm. like a few years ago when there was quite a lag time. It it it's much better today. Yeah, and I will go and kind of reiterate what Christine just said. We track it year to year. So we started doing e-approvals. I wouldn't say it was back in like 2010 or something like that. I may be a couple years off. But the last couple of years, almost all the EMP versions that come out are meeting the simultaneous criteria. There's not a large percentage of things that publishers are waiting years to put out in the e-book format if they're going to live in e at some point. There are some... Um, 
kind of nuances between models. So it may come out as an ebook but not be available in the DDA model, and so the library would get it as an approval shipment if they have a book plan instead. But as far as that eight-week window, majority of the E and P books, when we profile a print, if we if there's an ebook equivalent coming out sooner than later, the publisher tells us about it right off the bat, and we link them up, and that's how those E preferred plans work. And we can hold that print book back until the ebook comes out. And usually it's within a week or so, if not simultaneous with that print, but there are a few cases where it does take a few weeks to get out, or for some reason there's a delay in the ebook coming out, and at that point we would reverse sub and substitute that print title. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, we have come to the three o'clock mark at this point. There are still plenty of questions in, in the queue here. Um, and I apologize, as I said before, that we didn't get to all of them. We got to a good many of them, though. Um, I would just take a, a real quick moment to say thank you, Ashley and Christine and Simona, for taking the time to put together the presentation and for all of the information you've uh, shared today. Just thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank and, you. And, and I just would remind folks before uh, everybody signs off here, that we did record the program today, so be on the lookout for that follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a record, uh, link to the recording. Um, and you should also see a link to the quick six-question um, survey in your chat box there. If you could fill that out just at the end of the session here to let us know how we did today, we would really appreciate that. And thanks everyone out there for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope the rest of your day is great. Thank you.